I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you who were, once, who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And now let's just pray for Henry as he comes up to speak to us this morning. Father God, thank you. We, we thank you for our brother Henry. We thank you for sending him to us. Uh, and Lord, we ask that you bless him. I know you've already blessed him through his preparation for this passage. And Lord, uh, bless him as he speaks to us this morning and encourage him as he makes clear your word to us. And Lord, help us to, to listen attentively to him. Amen. Thank you so much for having me here today. I feel blessed already through the song and the prayer and yeah, praise the Lord. And it's my first time and it's just wonderful to be here. Can I tell you a little story about another first time that I never forget? The first time I singing in front of people was at my wedding. Um, and I practiced with the band and the day come and at the night, I mean at the banquet evening, I came up to the stage and you know in Vietnam the wedding you usually have 500 people, 550 people, lots of people. And I started the first line, I realized that I totally lost my voice. I was like, felt like it's, it's like that quacking, but you know, you started something, you need to finish it. So I finished the thing. And several years later, um, my, my wife's relatives from the States, they, they, they met us again and they say, oh, Henry, I remember your wedding. I say, oh, wow, you sing at your wedding. You sing at your wedding. And I thought, it must be really bad that it's, it's left such an impression on them for such a long time. <laughs> and the key thing is like this. Today, now, is my first time preaching. And my prayer that whether it's bad or it's good, I pray that you're going to take something away. Um, and the Lord going to work on us together. Let's, let's pray again. I would love to pray for me and for all of us as well. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord, for the time here. Thank you, Lord, for looking upon your servant. Thank you, Lord, you have chained, chained my hands for words and my finger for battle. And Lord, you had help to prepare. And you have spoken. Teach me every single thing, Lord. But today, not only for my sake, but for the sake of everyone here, could you please help us, Lord, to focus on your words, that you're going to talk, you're going to give the power of the Holy Spirit, make it alive in our life. And Lord, we give thanks and we trust that you're going to encourage us accordingly. 
In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We are at, in one of the very, very important and lovely passages, Romans 11. And last week, um, Jackie has already walked us through the vines and, uh, you know, the olive and how God that worked through the branches and everything. Um, and then, so we start with verse 25 today, and you see that Paul say, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery. So the word you here is actually continue from the verse 13 earlier. Basically, Paul said that now I'm speaking to you, Gentiles. So you here is clearly that he's saying, Gentile, I'm speaking to you. That do not be ignorance of this mystery. Sometimes we, because of ignorance, because we don't know, like I, I'm a beginner classical guitar, so I go to my teacher every week, and then he will give me a piece, and I, I practice during the week. And one particular week, I practice quite hard, and I, the tune sound quite nice. And I thought my teacher gonna be very proud and gonna be love it. So I play a bit, and then he said, oh, "No, no, no, Henry, stop." I said, "What's wrong? Your guitar is out of tune." And he couldn't, he had to stop me because he, you know, for the ears of the musician, that is, you cannot listen to the out of tune guitar. But for me, it's like I thought, oh, I'm doing fine, I'm doing really well, but it's, it's not even in tune, you know. And sometimes, the same problem, that because we don't know the mystery that God's trying to say there. And the mystery, when, whenever you see the word mystery in the Bible, it's not just like a guitar, it's, it's something big, something very important. And in Paul already mentioned another mystery in Ephesians. If I open for you to, if you've got a Bible, open to Ephesians 3.6. And then here Paul said that, this is a bit, it's a bit low. <laughs> yeah. Um, 3.6 says that this mystery is that Gentiles are fellow heirs member of the same body and partakers of the promise Jesus Christ through the gospel. So in Paul, my, if you remember the book of Acts, Paul, whatever, on the Sabbath day, where he go? He go to the synagogue. He, his heart is for the Israelite. Roman Romans will already see that he really anguished because Israel rejected the Lord. So he only go to the Gentile and they the first dispute in the church is that they, they thought that Gentiles have to be Jews, Jewish before they can access to the blessing of the Lord. But then they have the big discussion, the council meeting, and they realize that it's not. The Lord will is that everyone have the same equal access to God the Father through Jesus Christ. And so that was the mystery in Ephesians, that Gentiles is a fellow heir. They are not a second-class citizen. But now, Paul come back to another mystery, and he's talking to the Gentiles now. That, hey, do you know that there's a mystery? And the mystery goes like this. A partial hardening, in your translation, is going to be, Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So hardenings, um, and thank you, Nigel. I think he has already chose Deuteronomy 7, which is perfect explanation that the hardening here is not because of God. We need to remember that because Israel is responsible. You see that in Deuteronomy 7, God said that he, 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 not, he basically set forth a very clear govern, governance with his people and he even has affection on them. He chose them, Israel, not because they are a big or mighty nation, but because they are a small nation, and he just loved the forefather, and he chose them accordingly. So the hardness, hardening is not because of God, but because of Israel is responsible. And also in Romans 10, you can say that, Paul said, all day long, I, 
God have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people, which is Israel. So that's why what happened there. And the next section we're going to see is basically from verse 26. He said that, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. All Israel will be saved. This is very important. Jackie said the five words. <laughs> and uh, Graham, we have a, basically the preacher meeting and people come and I'm being new and Graham say that. Henry, you got the, the best passage in this section. This is the most important passage ever. I said, really? I said, okay. And then, and, and you know, it's like, these are very important and you have to tell people about the three views. And I didn't even know what are the three views about, about this one. So I start to come back and try to do a little digging, read up a little bit. So basically, we need to talk about the three views, otherwise Graham would be very offended. <laughs> but, you know, God speaks to us through people as well, right? Yeah. Younger preacher, the older preacher will give a good advice. So the view number one is, they say, oh, all Israel will be saved. But look at them. They are not accepting Jesus Christ at the moment. So there must be, maybe they, God will save them through another means, through another sort of covenant, so that they can really, in the end, they can be saved. And I hope nobody here will accept that view, because that is, I mean, I dare to say that it's not biblical. Through Jesus Christ alone, He's the way, the truth, and the life. And there's certain things that God cannot ignore our sin. He cannot just put away our sin just like that. Because of righteousness, because of justice, He needs to do something there. So, you know, even the Old Testament saying, they are saved through Jesus. You ask me how? They never heard about Jesus' name in the Old Testament. How can they save through Jesus? So God forgive their sin when they do all the sacrifice, all the confession and things like that. But we know that the blood of all the sacrifice is just a reminder of sin. That they, to remind them, the Lord just remind them, to reveal to them that we are sinner, And we need God's forgiveness. And then, how God can forgive? It's by he look upon Jesus, but he look upon all the sin that Jesus take. And he just take that, accept that. So the Old Testament sin also saved through Jesus. So I hope that by, by, by when we, we should be like a training kind of, like a hunting dog, you know, when we smell something that's wrong, we need to know that this is, not acceptable. That view is not considered that nobody can save without Jesus. I can, okay, I have this one. It's like, this is called the Babylon Tower. My, my daughter bought it during Christmas and she never have a, I think it's something like a Rubik. So she, she when she bought it, she just tried to do it and she, sometimes you say, Daddy, I got one, so one size, one color, and then the next day you say, oh, another size, so and things like that. Eventually, she said, oh, I got everything solved. And I couldn't believe it because you gave it to me. I don't know how to do it until now. I have no clue how to do this kind of thing. So, and the other day, I, I read BBC. They have the article. They say that there's a billions of combinations in the Rubik, but there's only one solution. So there's a billions of ways that people can seek God. Some born in the Christian family, that parents would tell them directly that Jesus is the way. But there's only one way to God the Father is through Jesus. There's only one solution. Regardless how do you fight, regardless your starting point, regardless where we are seeking God from, Jesus is the only way. So we have to cross out that view number one. The second view would say that, and I'm, I'm going to be more sympathetic with this view, because it says that Israel is already replaced 
by the church. So somehow in the process that the transition that, that Israel replaced by the church, and when we say that all Israel is saved, it means that it's fulfillment in the church, you and me today. And, and I mean, we can more sympathetic with that view because we are also called the children of Abraham. So a lot of promises in the Bible made to Israel also fulfilled in us, the church. But we have a problem with that, with the interpretation because just now we say that Paul is talking like, I'm talking to you Gentiles. So he has a very clear view that this is Gentile, this is Israel. It cannot be suddenly it's become one just like that. And, and we also forget, this view also forget that how special Israel in the plan of God, how, spe how special Israel is. And, and we can see that in Deuteronomy, that you can see God loved them, God chose them. And this morning I read, when I flipped the Bible, I saw some verse in, in Isaiah say that, how can the mother forget her nursing infant? Israel is like nursing infants. And um, how many of you think you are the apple of God's eyes? Can you raise your hand? I'm sure Tanya would raise her hand very... <laughs> Yeah, it's good. It, I mean, according to the gospel, according to the Bible, we are the gospel. We are the apple of God's eyes. But when it comes to nation, Israel is the apple of his eyes. He loves Israel. And this view, when we say that Israel is really replaced by the church, I don't think we do justice to what God has his heart for Israel. So that is... Second view, uh, I don't think that view is, is valid. So the third one is basically say that Israel as a nation, someday, somehow, they're going to be safe. And the way that they're going to be safe is the same with everyone else, that they're going to they're gonna sing with us. Jesus, Messiah, name above all names, bless his Redeemer, Emmanuel, they will accept that Jesus is the Messiah. They will turn back. And, and Jesus himself said that, if you look at, with me to, to Matthew 23, verse 37. And you can see the heart that Jesus himself had for Israel. Matthew 23, verse 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her fruit under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again. Until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Lord will come back. And Israel will say that blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Peter used the words that, you know, the, the books of us start with that. They, they will ask, ask Jesus, is, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They ask that very question. And Jesus said that you don't know the time or the hour. We don't know that, the timing, but I think Paul already gave us some hint there. He said that until the fullness of the Gentile has come in, so until the gospel proclaimed to all the nation, to the Gentile, and then Israel, all will be saved. And I think we can move on to the next one. From verse 30 to 32, basically, two words that you're going to see from out there, um, disobedience and mercy. So when I asked my wife, Hannah, what do you think about Romans 11? And she said that um, basically nobody is deserving. Everybody needs God's mercy. And the nation is the same as well. And I, I see actually referring to this section that because of, our dis, because of their disobedience, 
that we have mercy, but also because of our disobedience that God yields, that he's going to have mercy on somebody else. And sometimes people ask me, I mean, when I share gospel with the people, they will ask like, Henry, how about those that never heard, never heard about the gospel? Whether do they got saved? But you think about it. The problem when we ask that question is that we think we are deserving, that everyone deserves that God is obligated to save people. But it's not. The problem is we are all undeserving. We are all sinners. We are all disobedient. And it's because of His mercy that He let us, He sent the Son and died for our sin. From verse, and um, we end with that doxology that um, say that as regard to, sorry, I'm a little bit lost the trend of my thought now. <laughs> the death of, yeah, new preacher, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> the death of riches and wisdom of God and how unsearchable are his judgment and how inscrutable his way. So we already, the song that we sing, the psalm that we read, that is no doubt about it. I want to open a little bit on to Jeremiah 9, uh, verse 23 to 24. And um, let me do that. Why did I choose that? That verse is because earlier Paul said to the Gentiles, do not become proud. And we're starting this whole passage saying that do not be wise in your own eyes. So the question is, how? What can we do to respond to this? So basically, Jeremiah 9, 23 say, Thus say the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understand and know me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, righteousness in the earth. For in this thing I delight, declare the Lord. And I hope and pray that this is going to be our boasting this new year. When I, I came by birth this morning, because obviously we have only one car, and my wife and children will come to the service later, uh, the, the 1045. And I came to the bus stop, and I see uh, we met a, a uh, I think that, that brother must be from uh, somewhere in Africa. He looked very tired. He was waiting for the bus, and we just missed a bus. And then he said that, oh, I work through the night. He started work his shift from 10 p.m. yesterday. And, um, and he just finished work and he's coming home. And he see me carrying my Bible. I say, which church you go to? I say, Wycliffe. And he say, I go to Vineyard. And I will go home now. And I try to take a quick shower and take a short nap. And I, I try to attend the service at 11 a.m. And I told him, oh, the Lord will honor those who honor Him. You know, like this morning I heard from Miriam that she, she has a hard week, but she chose to come today. The Lord will honor her accordingly. Cheryl looks really tired, but she chose to come today. The Lord going to honor Him, honor her accordingly. And I pray that we're going to honor God. How many of us have a Bible reading plan? By the way, because the man that, when he comes to the bus stop, he say, when I walk to the bus stop, I also put on my one-year Bible reading plan and I listen. I say, oh, I'm sure Vineyard going to bear fruit this year. The church that he go to, if he have more like, members like that. So how many of us have the Bible reading plan that is one year take you through the Bible one year or two year or three year. Can you raise your hand if you have Bible reading plan? That's good. Okay. 
Can we honor God this year? I'm going to ask you again the next time if I come standing here. I promise you I will ask you again. You can pick any plan. My wife loves Nikki Gumbo plan, and she doesn't, if you know my Hannah, she doesn't really, someone that gets excited very easily. But she's really excited about this Nikki Gumbo devotion. He says it's really good and it's really that speak to her heart and yeah, very practical and applicable to the day. Or you can just like me, I just go straight to the Bible. I don't have anybody read devotion, whatever. I'm from Vietnam, so I usually use my phone, turn on the Vietnamese Bible, and then I read in English. So you like you got Vietnamese speaking and you got English and it's it's more color. There's some plan that can read to you with music, classical music. But can we honor God by put forth? Start with the Bible. Start with the words of God this year. Yeah. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you again, Lord, for helping me today. Thank you again, Lord, for speaking your words. And we pray, Lord, that we see your faithfulness to Israel. That how you bless them as a nation. And Lord, we know that you are a massive God. That you just don't deal with one person here and there. But you have all nations like a bucket, like a drop of water in a bucket. The whole world is in your hands. So Lord, we pray for our little gathering here, that you bless us, Lord, encourage us, and multiply us. Lord, let us bear fruit. Let us fall in love with the Bible. Let us fall in love with seeking you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.